last week, but we, you still remember the, the, the very lesson last week. It was about love, the primacy of love, love which is one of the three theological virtues. Today, we will hear something special about the first theological virtue, and that is the virtue of faith. Well, the three theological virtues, of course, we know faith, hope, and charity. So today is a lesson about faith. But first, let us put it in context. 600 years before the time of Christ, Babylon was the superpower of all the Middle East, and their capital was near Baghdad, the present-day Baghdad. So they were so powerful. And the king of Babylon had this desire to conquer every nation in the Middle East, including Israel. And so to do that, I mean, it's, it was not easy. Israel was known to be a very formidable foe, and so the king of Babylon started to harass Israel from the north because that was the weaker region of, of Israel. And so they started because there were 10 tribes in the north, but the southern tribe is the tribe of Judah, which is the center, which their center is Jerusalem. It was really very formidable, very strong. And so Babylon started harassing, attacking the northern kingdom of Israel for 17 years until finally... Finally, the Babylonians were able to destroy the temple and all of Jerusalem. And it was around this time that the prophet, in our first reading, Habakkuk, prophesied. But his prophecy was not really addressed to the people of God, but it was addressed to God himself. If you notice, it is a very short book, the book of prophet Habakkuk. It's only three chapters, but all of these are laments of Habakkuk. Lord, why have you done this to us? You know, we are seeing all the violence. When will this end? When will you help us? And then God would just tell Habakkuk, just wait and see, be patient. All I want is for my people to turn to me and to trust me. But of course, they didn't. They didn't until what eventually happened was they were taken into exile to Babylon, and they were there for 50 years, exiled in Babylon. So they were under foreign domination. The gospel of today has that kind of, you know, same theme. They were under a foreign domination, a superpower. At this time, the Romans were there in Israel. They were subjects to the Romans. They were subjects in their own land. It was very difficult for them because they had to be taxed everything, you know, for all of these things. Then they had to be, to, be, to be following the Roman law aside from their own Jewish laws. And so it was very, very difficult. But then at this time in the Gospel of St. Luke, we know, and we already talked about this, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He who was facing Jerusalem because that was really the ultimate, you know, fulfillment of the mission of why he came into this world to die for our sins. And so for two times, he was telling the people, I mean, his apostles, that something bad is going to happen to me. I will die there, but I will rise again on the third day. But of course, his apostles did not understand this. They didn't get it. You know, they still trusted that Jesus, with all his power of word and power of the miracles that he performed, they trusted that he will take over Israel. He will take over and eliminate all the Roman domination, the superpower, and then they will be there to rule Israel. So if you remember <laughs> brothers John <laughs> and James, the sons of Zebedee, right? if you remember, their, their mother said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, make it sure that my sons will be seated, one at your right and one at your left, the secretary of state and the vice president. They were trying to get that because their feeling was, oh my God, Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and he will take over power over the Romans. And so we make sure that we have this. But then they asked this very simple, small question. So, Lord, increase our faith. What kind of faith was it? Their faith was like our faith that we will conquer the Romans, that we will dominate the Romans, that we'll eliminate all of them. So it's some kind of faith. It was like a warrior faith. Ah, let us have this. You know, give us more faith so that we can fight this, this dominant force in our land. 
But of course, they didn't get it. And what happened was exactly the opposite. They were like defeated. Their master was defeated. Jesus was hanging on the cross like, oh my God. And so they started to run away. They were so discouraged. Jesus was after not the amount of faith, probably to distinguish his apostles from the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. The scribes, the Pharisees, they know the law. They, from the smallest letter to the law, they, they are experts of the law. They have this deposit of faith in their minds and their hearts. They were so good at it. And then Jesus compared his apostles. Oh my God, my apostles are uneducated people. They are farmers, they're fishermen, carpenters, you know, one or two maybe know little about money, but that's it. They're very poor in their faith. But then Jesus said, it's okay, it's okay. Lord, increase our faith. In other words, he did not really answer the question. He just said, if you have the faith, if you have a faith as small as the mustard seed, which was the smallest seed. Of course, now science would prove that mustard seed is not the smallest seed, right? But at that time, the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. There are even uh, airborne seeds, right? Uh, what do you call them? And then they stick on trees, and then they just... But that was the thing, you know. If you have the faith the size of the mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree or this mountain, be uprooted, and it will, command, it will obey your command. In other words, I can take you from where you are. And that is always what God does to us. He takes us from where we are. He does not expect us to be experts right away. He said, that's okay. If you just have the faith the size of the mustard seed, you can do great things. In other words, Jesus was not after the amount of faith, the deposit of knowledge of faith in your mind and in your heart, rather than the kind of faith that you have, the quality of faith that you have. Not the amount, but the quality of faith, what kind of faith you have. And the parable today explains that. You know, a servant, he just said, you know, what who, who, who is the master among you that when your servant comes from the field taking care of the, the, the farm and then you ask him to sit down and eat and then you wait for him? No. You will, of course, sit down and then you ask your servant who just came from the field to work and prepare for your meal. Why? Because the servant, this is not Jesus condoning slavery here. No. The lesson we have to learn is that a servant in those times is somebody who has no life of his or her own. A servant is totally dependent on the master. He is or she is a property of the master. In other words, everything that he or she is is from the master. He's totally dependent. Whatever the master says, the servant does. In other words, he has no life. Everything depends on his master. And he would trust his master for everything. And so this is what Jesus is trying to say. You know, you have that faith of total trust in God to really know and acknowledge that nothing comes from you, nothing we ever own in this life. Everything is a gift from God. And you just have to accept that, that we are God's children and He loves us and He wants to make sure that everything's going to be okay for us if we just trust Him. So not the amount of faith, not the quality, not the amount of faith, but the quality of faith. So it doesn't matter if you have been to theological schools who study everything about faith, you know. You just have to have that kind of faith that can move mountains, the quality of faith. Uh, there's a story about this. Um, Laverne W. Hall, if you know, she's an author, a southern author and a poet. Uh, she, she tells a story about there was, there was a town that was going through a very difficult time of drought. So week after miserable week of drought, no rain in sight. And so the ministers of the town, all the pastors of the town, they gathered together. And they decided that they will bring all their congregations, all their people to the town hall, I mean to the town plaza to pray for rain. And then they asked them to bring an object of faith for divine inspiration. And so when the appointed time came, everybody went to the town plaza and bringing all with them their objects of faith. A lot of people brought Bibles and, you know, novels of inspiration, spiritual rosaries, the crucifix and everything. They were bringing everything. 
And then they prayed and prayed for after an hour, as if for some divine cue, it started to drizzle and started to rain. And then all the more people, oh my God, our prayers are answered. And then they started to raise their objects of faith to the, to the air and said, yeah, thank you for the rain. But there was in the middle of the crowd an object of faith that really stood out from everybody else. It was the object of faith brought by a nine-year-old little girl raising her object of faith. You know what was it? An umbrella. <laughs> umbrella. She knew her faith was so simple. I know that when we pray, God will answer us. That's simple faith, bringing an umbrella. Everybody, of course, was bringing like a Bible to pray, but she was bringing the very practical thing, umbrella, because I know it's going to rain. A lot of times in our lives, we question God. You know, we question God. What is the quality of our faith, really? You know, is our faith really that, you know, a Sunday go to church kind of faith? Or when I have a problem, I pray to God kind of faith? Or if I need something, I ask God kind of faith? Or is it total dependence upon God? And in the Bible, there's so many examples, especially in the gospel. The faith of little children, we just dismiss our children today. You know, Jesus would say, let the children come to me, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. The purity, the simplicity, and the total and complete trust of a child to his or her parent. And the faith of that woman who was bleeding for 12 years, she was, she was hemorrhaging, and she lost all her money going to all kinds of treatments and doctors, going to the hospital and, and you know, doing all the MRI, and nothing happened. And so when Jesus was in town, she knew that only Jesus can heal her. And so in the midst of the crowd, she squeezed herself, and then she touched the tassel of Jesus' cloak. And then Jesus said, who touched me? And they said, are you crazy? Everybody's touching you. There's a million people touching you here. But he said, no, I can feel it. There was power that come out of me. Who touched me? And when he turned around, it was the woman that was bleeding, but now completely healed. And he said, woman, such great is your faith, and your faith has healed you. And remember the story of the centurion, right? You know, Jesus was walking, and then the centurion approached him and said, can you please heal my servant? My servant is dying. And Jesus said, okay, I'll go. He said, no, 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 Lord, please. I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I have never seen such great faith in all of Israel. Your, your servant will be healed. And that servant got healed right there, very, that very moment. So these people didn't go to theology. These people didn't have all the stock of knowledge about their faith. These were simple people, children, women that were not really, you know, they were isolated from society. And even this centurion, who was a Roman, he was not Jewish. He, didn't, he, he doesn't care about, you know, the Jewish law. But he trusted Jesus, complete faith and trust in God. Faith is an external manifestation of an inward spiritual grace. May we have the faith of a child, the faith of the hemorrhaging woman, the faith of a servant to his master, and the faith of the centurion trusting Jesus to heal his servant. And when that happens, we know that only in God is our true salvation.